All right, welcome to my 12th webinar. Um, I guess the next one's going to be the one year anniversary webinar. Um, so anyways, this is the 12th webinar. I'm, we're, I'm talking about using a microcontroller to measure phase between voltage and current in ultrasonic transducer. Uh, many of you folks who are joining in know that phase angle uh, is really required for frequency, resonance frequency tracking um, to do that accurately. And, and I'll hopefully get some questions from you all as to why not just, you know, monitor current, for example, why do we need to do voltage as well? Or, or sorry, why do we need to control phase as well? So I'm going to kind of go over a practical circuit. So I'm going to explain theory, a specific circuit that we're going to be using. I'll explain generating a large voltage, um, to drive a transducer, theoretical analysis of the phase angle measurement circuit, and also practical implementation on a Arduino, uh, and um, actually using circuit components that are very accessible. Uh, so here is the outline again. I'm going to explain why would why would we want to track phase, and I'll describe a circuit to do that. And it's kind of PWM based, you could say. I'm going to be converting uh, the voltage and current into uh, square waves of equal magnitude, and then I'll be practically adding them and then taking the average. So as you can imagine, if they're in phase, the they'll be the lowest duty cycle. If they're out of phase, they'll be the highest duty cycle up to 100%, you could say theoretically. Um, in the second part, I'll talk about the circuit construction. And again, you should be, after watching this uh, webinar, also the replay in this PowerPoint presentation that I'll be sending afterwards to the folks who registered, um, I'll, you'll be able to, you should be able to do this. And if you can't, then let me know and I can kind of fill in the details and probably put that information online as well for others who might have not been able to follow along as closely as they would like ha would have liked to. Uh, and I have some videos and some screen uh, recordings to show the circuit in operation and probing at different points, including the Arduino and the circuit itself. Um, the circuit that I made, so I'm driving an atomizer here and I just wanted I just want to show something that works because that's always exciting when you see something move and something work. I usually choose an atomizer for my demonstrations because, well, and this is phase tracking. This 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 specific circuit is the one I use, and I'll explain. It's a little bit messy. Uh, I didn't really clean it up, but uh, it's actually using phase tracking in order to accomplish um, the, finding the resonant frequency. Um, but before we get into the meaty details of this technical topic, I'd like to introduce my company, um, Ultrasonic Advisors. Uh, I have experience, you know, it's me as a consultant. I've experienced in many different transducers and their product development. Um, I know how product development works in ultrasonic transducers, where the issues are, what tools are needed, uh, when to move forward, when to dig in, how to do proper measurements and troubleshooting. Um, I've had experience with so many different types of projects, um, and I am excited to bring that expertise to your team if you feel like you need the, uh, the support. Typically, clients come to me after they've developed and made a first prototype that they want to make working better. So if you're, you're a company who's made the first prototype, it works, but now you want to make it something real, um, something repeatable. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not missing huge details and um, not going to waste time in your actual development going forward, then contact me and I think uh, we'll make a, we'll be a great match. So going forward. Let's start talking about why do we want to measure phase? Um, and I'll just ask in the chat just to make it a little bit more interactive. Why sh wh what's the purpose of measuring phase in an ultrasonic drive circuit? What, 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 why would you want to do that? The phase between voltage and current. D um, does anybody have an idea? I guess it takes a, takes a little bit to type, uh, but I'll start I'll start talking <laughs> as well. Uh, so um, let's see here. Let me just I'm going to start to draw. Um, yeah. So one is one person mentioned, hey, to find the maximum impedance, I can uh, I can. So some somebody wrote. I'll just type it in here. Uh, some uh, okay. So so find max impedance. And this would be for like anti-resonant drive, like oh you'd want that, or you know min impedance, impedance for for resonance. But the same case you, you don't you don't you can just use current. Why not just use current to do that that value? Um, 
so uh, someone else wrote um, optimize the power factor. Another person wrote uh, the phase offset uh, implies a mismatched impedance. Uh, so you wouldn't get the maximum pulse. The pulse wouldn't be delivered to the transducer, or you may be saying like, it's not gonna be mechanically stimulated. So all of those are true, uh, but um, it's not how I would answer it. Now you could go, you could approach this topic from different areas. It's not perhaps I would answer it. So you're not necessarily trying to find the minimum impedance or the maximum impedance. The other person is to control the real power being delivered to the load versus the effective power. Yeah, that's also true. Like, hey, you don't want to be delivering all this voltage and current and it not being actually transferred into mechanical motion. Uh, so all those are all true and all actually very relevant for individual applications. Like they're that they're the the answer. But this this is how I uh, how I would look at it. Yeah, to provide a control point. Yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> yeah. So to provide a control point because you want to drive at a maximum a, a specific phase. So the phase you know phase indicates um, proximity to a re resonance frequency. Um, and phase uh, and and the resonant frequency changes changes um, and so uh, uh, and so does impedance does impedance or you know current to you know voltage to current ratio uh, so the the only the so phase is the is a very reliable way to track the resonance um, so you may also say, hey, why not track, why not just measure current and always get to the optimum current? So always get to the peak current, then you know you're at the resonant frequency. Um, that's not precisely true. You're not necessarily at the res exactly at the resonant frequency if you track the maximum current, although you're ver practically very close uh, to the resonant frequency. Uh, but you also don't want to be for many applications that are high Q. So also, so for high Q transducers, um, uh, which, uh, which undergo, um, like, uh, kind of, uh, sudden loads, um, you don't want to be exactly at resonance or, or anti-resonance for that matter, uh, or exactly at, uh, at resonance. Well, anti-resonance is a little bit more lenient, but I, I focus on the resonant frequency because that's, that's more that's more utilized and more practical for most applications. But you don't want to be at the resonant frequency because once you get loaded or the frequency changes, then you have a huge drop in your um, in your current value in your in, in your operating conditions. I, I won't belabor this point too much, uh, but I'll just uh, you know draw the diagram of the, that traditional diagram we have of impedance, where we have our resonant an anti-resonant frequency. Um, and then I can put in like phase, which obviously goes from like, oh, that's actually not the best one, um, which can be very variable. So they're usually about zero at resonance and approximately zero at anti-resonance, although they can very much, they can be very different um, depending on what kind of transducers you work on. Um, if they are more highly damped, like if you have something like this, then your phase will always be negative or it won't reach 90 and negative 90, like you may see in a classic textbook, you kind of just have like something like that. So, or you may have something that goes a little bit positive, but won't get to this 90 degrees phase and negative 90. That's sometimes, sometimes surprising to people that, hey, the transducers don't always go from negative 90 to 90. So what happens when you, when you load the transducer, um, uh, you change the frequency. So the frequency may end up looking more like this after you've loaded it. And hopefully you all are following along because I'm drawing it live. Uh, <laughs> so then, uh, uh, and then the phase changes too. So the phase kind of follows along. So if you keep at like, let's say this constant phase right here, you'll be able to track the resonant frequency, but you don't want to be exactly at resonance because when you load and the frequency changes, you have a huge change in, um, and current, and it's not a stable position to be at a maximum uh, because 
you, you because it's hard to kind of track where which direction you need to go uh if you target a phase of like negative or usually it's a positive phase that we track so we're usually tracking slightly on the inductive side um then it provides a stable region to track resonance and that's that's what the one of the folks uh, rg um i'll just write initials rg uh he mentioned that or um that hey we want a stable control point that's it because the the current peak is not always a stable control point where you know where the resonant frequency is um also measurement of phase itself can you can use that to measure to calculate power so if power is very important for your application you need to measure phase somehow even if you don't track it that closely or you probably will but you need to calculate power um so yeah everyone who kind of wrote in was was true but this is just the way i look at it personally um i i, I like the the stable control point so the one reason to measure phase is just because we want to do calculations. So I'll just let me write that down. So the one reason is, hey, for calculations, we want to know how much. And the other reason is for for a stable control point for use with frequency feedback. We change frequency to monitor the move, monitor the uh, resonance uh, and it provides a stable control point. All right. Uh, so yeah, keep, keep whoever wants to keep kind of chiming in with questions or or, or other comments. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll read those out. Um, um, all right. So here are some very basic circuits to measure uh, the phase angle. Um, so what you do. So this is I'm I'm describing two steps. So this is what I'm going to do. Now there's probably ICs. A lot of different methods to do phase angle measurements, um, you know, signal multiplication and things like so. But I, I am actually just doing signal addition uh, and kind of logic, logic operations, you could say. Um, so we start out with so this is just a, a circuit. This is kind of like a simulated circuit or signal diagram. So I start out with a sine wave here. All right. So just like, you know, our current or our voltage is going to be a sine wave. And then what I do is I feed that sine wave into a op amp or an amplifier. Now, depending on how how what voltage these are all running at, um, because I have this hooked up with no resistors, like for feedback, the 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 gain is going to be the open loop gain of this op amp. Although you'd want actual in reality, you put some circuit components in there to make it. Uh, make it happy uh, uh, and, and, you know, kind of make, make the circuit work. Uh, usually not putting components, no, no components at all creates kind of floating references and capacitances start to invade and, and not feel good for the system. Um, but in essence, if you don't put any feedback resistors on an op amp or another type of amplifier, then you'll have infinite, in, not infinite gain, you'll have the open loop gain of that op amp. So what it changes this into at the other end, it becomes this. Now you would have a negative side, right? But here, I, I the the other terminals ground, so we actually don't get this negative side. We just get a positive square wave. So it changes a sine wave into a square wave, and the amplitude is going to be dependent on whatever voltage you supply. So it'll change the sine wave to a square wave, um, and if, even if you know if the if the sine wave is big. Sorry, if it's if it's large or small, uh, we'll have a. We should still be able to change it into a into a square wave of the same. Um, yeah. So yeah, comparator. Yeah, that's the kind of more uh, uh, specific word for it. So it just changed into a square wave and positive positive going square wave. Perfect. Um, now I'm simplifying here again. So let's say this is that this is a square wave of current this this specific voltage supply which is you know in reality we don't have a supply we're actually doing measurements and this is the supply for another for current so let's just say this is voltage and this is a current a voltage which represents current like if you measure voltage over resistor that's current so i have these diodes here which are going to prevent um prevent these voltages from interacting so what this actually does when you put these to a diode it, and you and you have a resistor, so if you didn't have this grounding resistor, it would just the voltage would just float 
because you would, it would the, the, the charges accumulated on this side of the circuit would have nowhere to go or the voltage would, would really have nowhere to go. So it would just kind of remain stagnant with the open circuit capacitance or something like that. So, but what happens actually when you have this, when you have put this resistor here, you add. So if you have your current, let's say looking like that, and I'll draw a voltage in, the, in black, let's say, and, you had, and, you, and they're going to be obviously the same duty cycle because of, they're the same, um, um, they're the same frequency because you're measuring off the same circuit. So this is all sine wave based. Uh, then actually in the end, you'll get something that looks like this. So you have, you'll have, you'll, your, your duty cycle will change. So the lowest duty cycle obviously is 50%. So if they completely overlap, you're not going to see any difference when you kind of add the signals together. Um, and they're not completely added. They're just, it's another, yeah, it's another kind of logic operator that it's like a or. I guess it's an or operator, you could say. Um, so you can go from 50% to 100%. So 50% would be, a, you know, zero degrees. And 100% would be 180 degrees out of phase. That means where, where one is starting, where one is ending, the other one is starting. And then you just never really have your this the resistor is never really seeing a zero zero or no voltage, um, and and this circuit right here just does an average. So it just this takes this and creates an average value for uh, it's basically a resistor and a capacitor. Uh, it's kind of like a modification you could say of a peak detect circuit, except we're just we're just holding on to, um, I guess, I guess it is in this essence a peak detect circuit with, uh, with just two signals going into it, and because it's changing that PWM signal, you could say the duty cycle of a constant voltage into a uh, uh, into an average value, we essentially can get. Of a DC voltage auto, and I'll, and I'll show the the, the LT spice diagram. Uh, we basically get a DC voltage from a phase difference. So let me just open this up and show. Okay, so this is not the one, but this is the one here. Um, so I want to focus on this side of the circuit here. So I've already I've already run this diagram. So I'm just going to clear it. So this is the voltage on the top. And I, you can set this like uh, I set the delay for five microseconds, which would be kind of 180 degrees. So let me set it for two, let me set it for two microseconds, um, and I'll mind the time for sure. Uh, and then we'll set we'll look at this one. So these are voltage and current, let's say out of phase, and they went through the comparator, and now they are like uh, they're square waves of equal amplitude. Um, then on the other side we have this. So they're like average. See, like, uh, do you see how where the only time there's it, the signal on this side is zero is when they're both zero. So they're kind of added together. And if they're 180 degrees out of phase, it'd be like a constant voltage. And then what happens on this side is we get a average value, this VP002. So if I press control, so right now we have an average value of 3.2 volts. Okay, we have 3.2 volts, and it's approximately 90 degrees out of phase, you could say. 3.2 volts. So if I made them exactly in phase, I now have 2.4 volts. So you could say I have a, you know, 0.8 volts between 90 degrees, approximately, and uh, zero degrees uh, of phase. So therefore, we can, we, we can know, the, we can measure phase, basically if we can characterize the circuit properly. Now, these components don't all work nicely. Like the diodes are have some capacitance in them, even though we'd like them not to. And, you know, the the shape of these, com you know, co comparative, uh, the square waves are not like, are slightly amplitude dependent on what you put in. So it's not, um, yeah, it's a, it's a low pass. Low, it's a low pass. Uh, so yeah, this RC is a low pass filter, uh, but, but yeah, it's also kind of also known if, if you if you look if you do enough, it's like an average. That's that's another way of looking at it. It's also it's using the peak detect circuit. I also did that in the last webinar if you haven't checked that out. So yeah, it's a it's a low pass filter essentially. But you yeah you you put the signal pretty low. Um, so all you get is the average uh, in a sense. Um, all right. So hopefully I can I'm going to be sending this out and there'll be a recording on this. Um, but 
I have the circuit and the components and it uh, it works. So that's that's uh, that's kind of a nice thing, <laughs> I would say. It's always nice when it works. I started actually I started this using a op amp. Uh, it seemed to have some co capacitive coupling with both sides. Uh, instead of digging into that really deeply, I actually ditched that op amp and I used something a bit more sure that I was going to it was going to work and I'll, and I'll explain that. So okay, so we went through the we went through the theory already, so I won't I won't have to go through that again. Um, in, in in practice, this is the circuit I built. I had the microcontroller, which was an Arduino Mega. It could be any of the Arduino family or even whatever whatever works again with the frequency generation IC, which I now I have a sine wave. This is a sine wave generator. Last time I used a square wave, so a square wave generator would be good if you had uh, you know MOSFETs you were driving. Obviously, and the sine wave would be best if you had. Uh, oh, this is a sine wave. Sorry, it would be best. Well, if you're using a using a amplifier that works well with sine waves, like an audio amplifier, which I am using today. So I have an audio audio amplifier, a transformer, the transducer, which is an atomizer, and then phase that phase measurement circuit. And it fully implemented. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll describe what it looks like. Uh, in a second, but I'll just I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the components. So the components you want is what's called the AD9833. You can search this on Amazon, and the link is right here. This is the link to buy that chip off Amazon. And it all, anyway, basically, the reason I do that is because it has the pinouts already, and there's code already provided. There are probably other alternatives that you could use. It's also called the AD9837, but this is the one that you want to search for to actually find it online. So Arduino can provide frequency, but it doesn't have good resolution. So the Arduino can program the board to produce a sine wave. And this, this, this specific circuit is much more friendly in terms of uh, not, not having to know the code. The code pr pr provided uh, from the sources are much, much, is much easier to use. You can directly put in a frequency. So that, that, makes it, that makes it a lot easier to use than the square wave generator, which had you intentionally interact with the, you know, the, the PLL um, of the system and kind of getting slightly underneath the hood. Uh, this doesn't require you to get underneath the hood, at least with the, with the code provided. Um, I didn't exactly check the, how fast you can reprogram the frequency, but I think it's pretty fast. It's similar. The other square wave generator was one millisecond. That is last time. It seems to be on the same page as that. Uh, so this is how we generate the frequency from the microcontroller. Uh, in my case, I use an Arduino Mega, but you can use any of the, the ones provided. And there's slightly different pinouts for each of them, how you hook, hook it up, but there are, they are documented. Um, this is the same amplifier that I used last time. Um, the one important thing that I'm going to get into. So this amplifier I used for the driving circuit and also for the comparator. And I used it for the comparator because I knew it worked at this frequency. That's why I use it for the comparator. I could have probably spec'd out a different op amp and, and and kind of built its own stable circuit from that. But because um because I had it, I had these are pretty cheap, and I had several of them, and I decided just to go ahead and use it. Um, so I used three. I used three of these amplifiers: one for driving, but two for the measurement side. So that was kind of a um, a trick I did in order to make sure I got this project finished for you all on time and I wasn't screwing out with op amps, you know, for weeks. <laughs> so the important thing to, to know, though, uh, the, uh, the one thing you'll need to do if you're using this for an op amp, there's, there's a capacitor here on the output. For the comparator, you need to short this because otherwise it floats. There's uh, the, and the voltage kind, the average voltage drifts. Uh, so if you short that speaker, this is only for the comparator side. You need to short this uh, this um, capacitor. It's very easy to do. It's very noticeable. It's the capacitor right at the output. It's this guy right here. You can need to short it on the bottom side for the comparators only, not for the amplifier itself, because it does provide a low pass filter. So it does predict, pr protect against shorts or high current draw from low frequencies. Some folks have up upgraded this capacitor to a larger value for the driver circuit. I saw that online. Uh, it might be useful for you if you're really interested in using this device for, for, for practical work. Um, but I, for the comparator as well, I turned up the potentiometer, that right here, to the maximum value. Uh, so then we can get that, you know, we can get the sine wave to get to become 
as as good as possible. No, I'm not I'm not drawing. I'm not drawing with my pen right now. So if you get this again, get this sine wave to become kind of something like this. It's like a triangle wave, but like it's it's uh it's basically saturates the the voltage, but it, it, then in in the process it creates a square like wave. I showed this also in my last webinar about the amplification of the voltage. It's the same transformer I used last time. So I won't go over it. It's in the, the webinar 11. Um, so that was the current, that was the current tracking uh, webinar. Um, next measuring phase. So we have an option. Look, okay, where do we probe? We have to get a, we have to get a signal for voltage. We need to get a signal for current. So I decided to measure the voltage and current at the primary side uh, of the transformer. So that's this side with lower windings that are that's directly connected to the uh, audio amplifier uh, instead of the secondary side. Now, for also for medical applications, this is typical that we'll do measurements on the primary side, and we won't do it on the secondary side, so we don't have to have electrical kind of wiring hooking up to that side and potentially making a, a ground path for people to get shocked. Um, so the nice thing about that, the primary side is that the voltage is low. So it's, I can directly feed that voltage into the amplifier without using a, a voltage divider. And if you use a voltage divider, now you suddenly have to compensate for capacitance and frequency. So using a low voltage directly going into the amplifier was good. So I could just pick out the voltage from the output. I just put this voltage directly into another one and into, into another op amp and then amplified that one again, uh, all the way to the maximum. So that was kind of uh, simple. Um, and additionally, I used a 0.25 ohm resistor on the ground side, and I directly fed that into another amplifier. So I just put that into another amplifier, and all the grounds are, are one uh, in this case. Um, so the amplifier choice, I use the same uh, drive as the driver circuit. So I use three of these, and they come in packs of like 10 or something. So maybe for 10 or $20, you get 10 or five of them. So it's, it's, it's pretty simple to, to, to get all of those values and it makes your circuit a little bit more simple, but it can be a little bit messy because they, they're not exactly breadboard integratable. So in the way they are, but it, it does make it simple that you don't have to spec out all the components to make this work. I just, I just know off the bat that this can provide hundred kilohertz and have good, uh, have good uh, um, saturation or decent saturation. So I use shot, shot key diodes for a better high frequency response. And this is probably one of the sources of error are the diodes that have some capacitance associated with them. Uh, but in the end, you can characterize your system and you can pretty much know what voltage is going to relate to what phase, um, and especially with your transducer specifically. So I wouldn't recommend this, this specific circuit for like a precision phase measurement, unless you had like perfect square waves and stuff. Uh, but I would recommend it for, well, we need to get something practical. We need to minimize phase. That's that, that for that case, it's, it's pretty repeatable, I would say. So in a smaller voltage, remember smaller voltage measured is a lower phase and we're measuring voltage at this output after the, uh, after the filter, which averages, uh, the pulse pulse width modulation, um, you could say signal that are, that are coming out of the diodes in this resistor here. Um, and let's remind ourselves of this this pro, this this uh, transducer, the mesh atomizer. It is not um, it is not a good transducer in terms of it being well behaved and representative of most ultrasonic devices. But the thing I like about it is that if it's working, you can see it working. Like uh, not only like hear the buzzing or whatever, you can actually see it working, and it doesn't take a whole lot of power and voltage. So it is a very good learning um learning transducer except the fact that it doesn't behave so nicely so we see the phase here and the red when the with the fluid filled chamber it gets to like negative 25 probably with high voltage that phase is probably not going to get higher than negative 60 um negative 60 degrees so it's a very smushed you can say frequency response with a lot of spurious modes it's typically not um not representative of how you want to design transducers except that it just works really well so it's continuing to be used um so that is um the one challenge of this evaluating the circuit is like this is not a very well behaved ultrasonic device um 
So basically, you, you won't get as much variation in that phase voltage as we would have liked in order to characterize. But this you can see it working. So I think it's very, very important that we use such a device for understanding and learning and teaching. So here's a sweep from 100 kilohertz to 120 kilohertz. The red is the voltage over the resistors, and the blue is just the voltage on the primary. We see the voltages are quite small. So it's like 1.2. So so like 2.4 volts peak to peak voltage and the current on the is going to be 200 milli milli volts um uh you have to divide multiply that by four to get amps so i guess it's like 0.8 amps or something so uh it's also out of phase there's also some kind of ringing components here um this is measured on the primary side so we just have low voltages to work work with and and so voltage and current are kind of in the same ballpark now that resistor probably it being so large it probably did drop some voltage so we're sweeping frequency um and what i want what i want okay now it's we're gonna it's gonna go back again so around 107 you'll see this like see the current is high see this point right here the current is maximum but it's like not a resonant frequency where you have a lot of mist which is very interesting to see like hey high current but not a lot of mist it's it's pretty uh, unique and here's where here's about where if you see this point here is where it seems like it goes under under some anti-resonance it gets smaller and this is about where the phase is um you see 107 it's about where the phase is uh, uh in 109 and then we hit some anti-resonance so it's about right here is where we have that maximum phase in this case we're, i guess minimum phase the maximum height i guess from negative 90 it's the minimum phase closest to zero kind of area which then it's, it's another way of signifying a resonance and nothing really happens after that point um, uh, to get to 120. So this is another view of it. This is a D, so the green is a DC voltage. The blue again is still the voltage and the red is the current. Obviously this is using a large time base that I can't really make out the frequencies, but we can actually still understand um, uh, what's going on. So this is hundred kilohertz to 120. So you see as the frequency is sweeping, um, uh, don't mind this. This basically, see, you can see these choppy points. These choppy points are the start and finish. I go from 100 kilohertz to 120, uh, and you see the the DC phase is here. So about right here is kind of where the resonant point is. It's not where the maximum current is, by the way, uh, but this is where the phase changes, and then you you can see basically you can see the mist coming out. So you know there's power delivered, and you don't need to ask any anybody about it. There is power. So this is where you start to really see power pick up is where that phase changes happens. So probably you would characterize this and say, seek this phase. And this, in my program that I wrote later, I didn't seek a specific phase. I seek to minimize phase, which can be problematic if the phases, as you're sweeping frequency, the phases are kind of similar and they're not really changing too much. It kind of makes the, the program a bit confused. But in reality, if we, I were to implement this, I would probably say seek a phase related to 3.9 volts or something like that. So it, it basically changed from about 4. maybe 4.3 volts to about 3.8 volts. Um, that was the variation. Um, let's do here. So here's the here's now the output from the Arduino. No, it's not too big here. So let me just zoom in. Um, so it goes it did that same sweep, but it goes from I want to say so it goes from about eight hundred and fifty to about seven hundred when it actually lands on its target here, or lands at the minimum of phase seven. It goes from 780. So yeah, it's not that it's not there's not a good resolution. I, I'm gonna admit there's not good resolution and but there's not a whole lot of change in phase. I'll also say that too. So it's like the it is a bit limited by the transducer that we're using. And I didn't do a theoretical analysis just feeding in two signals. Um, that wouldn't be too useful. But it is actually, it does work. If you put it at a frequency other than the resonant frequency, you can find, you can make your way back to that range. That's true. So here's a case where I had my code. In my code, I stepped, I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna explain a teeny bit about the code, then I'm gonna jump back to this frequency tracking because it's a little bit more, it's a bit more amusing. Than, the, than just looking at the code. But basically I uh, do this comparison. So I, I step up in frequency 1000 Hertz and, and then I, and I compare it to the original value, whichever one is higher 
in terms of uh, the DC value is higher, which means the phase is higher. I don't want that. So I, I choose the value, which is lower. So I always go to the direction which has a lower uh, DC voltage, which means it has a lower phase or, or has a higher phase closer to zero or, or uh, at least in this point, because I'm just maximizing phase because I know the phase doesn't get, it's not going to get positive here in this, this, this uh, situation. So I is equal to 10, 20 means 120 kilohertz. So it starts off at, yeah, it starts off at 120, you see, you see this part right there. So this, it starts off at 20 and then it keeps comparing phase and here it's not sure, then tries again and it gets to this point about eight. And then it monitors there and it's actually missed. It wasn't, it was not spraying in the beginning. And then once it did this phase recognition, it started spraying. Now I probably wouldn't recommend phase tracking for this specific device. This is a very hard device to work with. Uh, I have worked with it before. It's not, it doesn't play by the rules. It's like very experimental and all the, all the resonant um, impedance responses of all the transducers are way different. All the spurious modes. It's kind of a crazy device to work with. Um, but uh but as I must serve uh, folks doing all different types of work, I, I have worked on it and I know it's not uh, simple and going too complica complicated with the device like this is not, is not fruitful, but I'm explaining and demonstrating. And I, and I like this device because of low power uh, requirements and it also shows when it's working properly. You can see it. So um, yeah, and let me know if you have any questions as, as I'm going, I'm kind of getting to the, toward the end now. Um, so here's the Arduino code and I will provide it um, in this uh, document and you can kind of copy this, copy and paste this code. But here's the, you have to download a uh, Arduino library for that specific, um, um, for to use that chip uh, or to use that uh, breakout board. And I can basically, this is, this, is a, this is a simple thing to set the frequency. For some reason, the frequency was off it was off by like a factor of 0.573. So I had to do that division, um, but that was not really a problem for me. Um, so what is basically going on in this loop is I first set the frequency, I read the DC voltage, I change the frequency, I reset the frequency, and then I compare these two, I compare them. And whichever way, whichever direction the phase is minimum, I march that way. If the phase is, if the phase gets smaller, if the phase gets larger, then I say, hey, go the other way. And if the phase is smaller, then I, do, I, I don't, it, nothing happens. It just continues to increment. So that's the way it works. And I only let it go on for 10 seconds. I recommend if you're running transducer experiments um, and doing code that you have some code always that shuts it off after 10 seconds or three seconds. So it doesn't just keep going and you don't got to keep screwing with the battery. And then I, and then I simulated it at 30 kilohertz, 30 kilohertz is a frequency where nothing really happens. Uh, it's not annoying, like a low frequency. If you do three, three kilohertz, you can hear it. So I, I just set it here and I exit. Um, and I can, uh, this is the serial print uh, value. You can also, I also change this to I so I can op implement and see what frequency I'm, I'm trying to program. Um, here are some of the pictures. They're not too pleasant. Uh, sorry. Um, so this is where, let me get the drawing out. So this is the, this is the Arduino. This right here is the uh, micro, the, the frequency generator board. This is the amplifier, which is used to drive. This is the region right here, which is the primary side. Here's the secondary side. Uh, here's the transducer. Um, and I'm taking voltages. So this is this is the one comparator. This is the other comparator. This color is not good. This is one comparator. Here's the other one. And here's these two diodes and those two resistors. Uh, and this signal right here is going into the analog uh, zero of the Arduino. And it's all doing the measurement. And um, here's a nine volt battery that I use. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. Uh, you should be able to put it up, hook it up pretty simply. Um, here's some more pictures, the Arduino, the, the microcontroller, uh, and oh, sorry, the, the frequency generator. Uh, this is the amplifier, this nine volt battery. Um, here's the primary side and there's different probes. That's the resistor going to ground. Um, and um, yeah, here's this thing working again. So it starts off 120 kilohertz. And then when it starts, when I press the button, 
there's mist coming out. Okay, I know it's working. Um, that gives me some relief here. Um, here's the schematic again. Okay. Okay, so here's a here's a schematic of the of of, of the whole system. Here's the Arduino. It's similar to the last diagram I drew in the last webinar. And here's the eighty nine eight three three uh, that that board. This is the audio amplifier board. Um, I have a resistor on the ground side on the primary coil of the of the drive, and then I feed one, I feed that into an op, you know the the op amp board, uh, and to get to make it a comparator, we have these diodes. Then there's this these resistors, and um, which they it makes an addition, basically a simple OR gate, you could say. If, is this one on or this one on? Then it will be positive. If none of them are on, then we'll stay at zero. And this is 100 ohm, 0 0.1 microfarad uh, pair, which then forms a kind of an averaging circuit or a low pass. Um, so, okay, so that was uh, the presentation and I'm gonna take questions and I will actually stop this, uh, stop the recording now. <laughs>